Right, so hello and welcome to our final panel of the day here at the, here at the CMIP Debate Theatre. I have a truly expert collection, a brain trust of industry luminaries to talk about content piracy in the internet age and how we can reduce it. So, I'm going to get them all to introduce themselves, starting with Alex. Hey, I'm Alec Kenthor and I work for Cast Labs. Uh, we specialize in digital rights management products and video player products and love to talk about piracy. And Joe. Uh, hi, uh, Joe Havenstreit, but everyone calls me Rojo. Um, I'm a director of product management for Digital Element. We're an IP intelligence location uh, solution. Uh, I've been with the company for 20 years, and for every day of those 20 years, I've been looking at and analyzing IP addresses. Wonderful. <laughs> David. Yes, I'm David Eisenbacher. I'm a, a co-founder and CEO of EasyDRM. We're a, a digital rights management as a service company, hosted and fully managed cloud service provider. And John. John Ward, Executive VP for Friend MTS, uh, responsible for business and strategy in the Americas, and we're a global content protection anti-piracy company based in the UK. Itzik. Itzik Wager, uh, responsible for product management and business development uh, for uh, Cina Media uh, Security. Um, Cina Media is about a half a billion dollar company, 3,000 employees, more than 1,000 customers worldwide, and our main focus is to change the space of anti-piracy. Perfect. So when we did this panel nearly three years back, we asked the question about piracy. And it was a lot of doom and a lot of gloom. It sounded really, really scary. Let's ask David. David, how has it changed? Where are we today when it comes to our fight against piracy? So, uh, so we, actually, uh, we actually ran a, um, a survey with streaming media a few months ago. And basically, as part of those questions, we asked them, how much are you losing in the revenue on piracy? And there were some numbers came in 21, 15, the consensus was about 20% of the revenue is lost in piracy. And, and that's you know from, uh, I mean basically, small sites all the way up to large sporting sites and, as well as content providers. Um, taking that data and going backwards, it's like, well, you're losing 20%, but you know, what are you doing about that? Basically, isn't it better to actually mitigate that and bring that percentage down to 5% and there wasn't really much move on there. Like, you know, they were almost afraid that doing anything would almost hurt that even more. Okay. So I'll ask this to Alex. Alex, every year we have a panel around security, and every year it seems to be a problem that hasn't gone away, and, and in some ways they've adapted. We, it's like cat and mouse. We find a, a, a way of detecting and stopping, and it changes. Where do you see ourselves now in our fight against piracy? Well, I think the kind of threats of pri pri piracy get very broad, right? So we, we, we all saw the news about Netflix's stock tanking because of the account sharing. Mm. And this is like a thing to deal with. And you know, on one hand, you have tools at your disposal like digital rights management, which may stop somebody from screen recording something. But that doesn't stop them from sharing a password with their family across the world, for instance. So there's more holistic approaches that we need to, to, to address there and limit kind of the ease of access that we've made content nowadays because you don't have to go buy a movie ticket and sit in front of a screen to actually watch content when it's on your TV at home. Okay. Uh, Joe, do you see it getting better or worse? You've been looking at IP addresses for a long time. Yes, is it I getting have. better or is it getting worse in your view? Uh, I would say it's, it's staying pretty steady and staying pretty consistent on the, uh, like, I like how you referenced um, the cat and mouse. We like to refer to it as kind of a game of whack-a-mole. You know, every time we put something out there to make it tr uh, more difficult for the VPN proxy vendors out there to, uh, uh, you know, pr provide their circumvention of, a, you know, of, of DRM, um, every time we combat that, they come back another way. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, take NordVPN, um, for the longest time, their proxy presence exists in a particular space on the IP landscape, typically in hosting centers, whether it's physical data centers or up in the cloud. But what they're, you know, and in our solution, you know, we'll label those IP blocks as proxies. It's a proxy, 
block that traffic, problem solved. The problem now we're seeing is that they've gotten creative and they're doing things such as hijacking residential IP addresses. Mm -hmm. Or they may think that they can go hide in the vast ocean that is the IPv6 space and will remain undetected there. So we continue to, you know, it's like a game of tennis. We're trying to just keep breaking serve mm -hmm. before we can win the match and it's just steadily ongoing. Okay. We hit back, they hit back, and so forth. I'll ask David, do you think it's getting better or worse? You know, I've been in this space now maybe 10 months. I came from the live production world, live sports, mm -hmm. and I, my guess is whatever number or whatever things that our group and our colleagues have been seeing is actually much worse, frankly, because I just think where there's a will to steal something, people will find a way to do it. it it, what's interesting to me, and I think that all of us are unified in this debate theater on this, I've been kind of amazed at how piracy, is, everyone is aware of it being a problem, but I've been kind of amazed coming from the production and operations space, why people haven't taken a more proactive approach towards it. It's a cost center or viewed as a cost center, and I think it's one of those things that as we move forward and try to kind of get the word out there and more evangelize than anything else, it's got to be something that you know, it's got to be returnable, return on investment, but I think it's got to get attention from different levels within a company. This just can't be something that's slapped onto a lawyer's plate or another job that gets attacked to somebody else. It's got to get, like, this is a sweet job, I think. It's like, I'll ask you the same question. Do you see it getting better, worse, or staying the same? So I think it's much worse. Okay. I think that the situation is that uh, the pirates of today are, are cyber criminals and they're using uh, cyber security techniques in order to uh, exploit vulnerabilities within our service provider services and in order to steal their services. So it used to be just stealing the content, but nowadays it's about stealing the service. It's all about uh, pirates that are uh, running scripts and, and using these scripts to duplicate tokens, to look like legitimate devices, and then to, to sell their customers and, and piggyback on on, on, the, on the service providers in order to serve their customers. The content that they provide is high quality, uh, low latency, directly from the CDN. So, so this is completely different type of piracy that we are exploring today. Just in COVID, the numbers go up of about 30% in terms of piracy. It's a serious problem. It's a threat to our customers and definitely something that they need to handle. We have a lot of standards in our industry and in cybersecurity. But in the cybersecurity world, many of the standards are best practice frameworks. How do you handle content? How do you handle authentication, logins? Are you guys seeing the industry coalesce around a particular standard or framework or set of technologies that are now just de rigueur for everybody? I'll ask Alex, do you, do you see that happening as an industry? So I mean, at a certain point, there's, there's not a choice, there's like some things you have to do. Like with okay. digital rights management, you know certain devices support certain things, and if you're trying to just basically actually have a rights management platform, you just need to use that. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely some best practices, I think, of this multi-tiered approach that, that is kind of combining the proactive solutions of you know putting a lock on a door versus a reactive solution of identifying who the pirate may be or who a compromised account may be and trying to stop that at the source. And I think there's a lot of uh, innovation happening with a lot of the people here sitting on the stage as well. And that's, that's kind of where it's at. There's not a best practice, or there's not a standard for any of this because piracy techniques change so rapidly, we have to adapt to that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very nice when we can create standards for the techniques we have to use one way or another. And uh, is, that's always beautiful to see. Joe, do you see any areas where all of your customers are standardizing around a particular type of technology? Not necessarily product, but technology layer. Right. Where do you see the, the, the market moving to? Well, um, I, I'm, I, I got to give David credit because he mentioned this earlier. It does have to be a multi-tier approach. You have to have uh, multiple angles in your defense against piracy. And um, from our perspective, from our point of view at Digital Element, having an IP location database and a proxy detection database is an absolute must. Because an IP address is a persistent point. You're not going to have any communication take place over the internet without it. 
So it's that is always a starting point. Yes, you can probably do more by getting on mobile device, you know, capturing GPS coordinates and doing geofencing. Um, you, you could probably implement other types of security protocols, but at the heart of it, an IP address is going to give you the starting point of identifying where is that end user geographically located and are we allowed to let them through based on that. Okay, check one. Check two. All right, they're in the right geographic area, but are they using any sort of proxy? Mm -hmm. um, and that should be in a major red flag right there. So to me, that's one standard I would argue for that if you aren't relying on some form of IP geolocation with proxy detection, you're doing yourself a disservice in combating that piracy. Okay. I, again, playing devil's advocate, and don't get angry at me chaps. <laughs> Isn't piracy just part of doing business? Isn't, don't, like, you know you have a shop, you have a shop and they assume that there's going to be 1.2% of shoplifting in a shop and they build it into their pricing structure. Am I naive to say that, I'll answer this to you David, is it just the cost of doing business? It's not the cost of doing business, it's like car accidents. I mean, basically car accidents happen but we're not going to take away stop signs, we're not going to take away seat belts, we're not going to do things to actually make people's lives better and safer. Okay. So. In piracy, and, and we, and, and you know, we're going to have, you know, a part of that previous question is, you know, is there a, uh, a formula or a consensus or a framework? Based over the years, we've all agreed that there's no silver bullet. Your first line of defense is that DRM system, like the lock on the door. Then your next line is your alarm system. That's your forensic, and, and you know, and like, and, and like, and like your additional watermarking. And then it goes up the stack. So you have to have like your two-factor authentication on your password sharing. You have to have your DRM as your first line of defense on on your content. Then you go up up the stack to your next level. That's you know your forensic watermarking for your alarm system. So you should never accept a hundred percent. You know, uh, basically, but you should never accept the loss. But yes, you got to mitigate the loss. You're always going to have something, but that's bringing it down from 20% down to maybe 5%. And that's a large amount of revenue mm -hmm. that the, the idea is to preserve yeah. and maintain because if you're running a company and like a quarter, you have um, you know, a 10% growth, you're all happy. That's a huge amount of growth. So basically every quarter you should be sad that you're losing that 10%, that 20%. So doing a little bit of, of, of effort up front with the multi, you know, layers and levels, this is why we all work together in partnerships. You know, we each do our part to actually make the complete solution. You make a very interesting point. I mean, you, you mentioned Netflix recent announcement about the sharing of logins. Now, the way to make that more difficult would be to have multi-factor authentication through a mobile device or some other method. But I guess the argument is it makes the user experience less easy Engage with. I mean, this is a, a, a question for you, John. What's the balance between security and ease of experience? Well, I, it's delicate, right? But I, I do think that the mis misstep I think mis that maybe Netflix made was promoting it in the beginning, right? I mean, they constantly came out and said that it's this is what you can do and be the thing to do. Look, I think at the end of the day whatever solutions implemented by any of us in any of our groups has to be secure, but with a cognitive sort of eye to what the user experience is. But I think it's also educating the public that piracy is also a real problem. Mm -hmm. There's a reason they're going through this. And it's not unlike what someone would do at home already with subscription-based apps on their computer, whether it's Microsoft, Adobe, or anything of that nature. So it's not terribly, I guess, complicated compared to that, uh, I would argue that the steps that all of us would try to enact along with any of additional security measure would be one to try to keep you know all of these companies from continuing one content costs go up but a lot of this stuff piracy contributes to the cost of these things going up to the customer to the, at the end of the day so I think it's important to remember that anything that's done from a security standpoint is one, trying to protect the content owner, but two, also trying to protect the platform and the experience kind yeah. of moving forward. I, I did a panel like this many years ago and someone said the thing that stopped piracy in the music industry was iTunes. Yeah. I was I always stuck in my head that once you made the experience of accessing content cheap, easy, 
and not free, but you know, low cost, piracy goes away. Is that true? Is that what the industry, because it's too expensive, we have lots of piracy? No, I think that the, to compare music to, uh, to video content is, is a, it's an, it's a wrong comparison. Okay. And the reason for that, that it can't, the cost of, of making movies, the cost of making sports right. is much higher than the cost of making mu music. So I, I don't think that it will ever happen that you will be able to, to balance the, the, the content cost that you have in, in video streaming mm. uh, out of uh, uh, not, you know, not doing uh, anti-piracy. But we are, we are getting quite close. If you think about the cost of a cinema ticket versus an all-you-can-eat buffet like a, a Hulu or a Netflix or a whatever, is that changing the mindset of both the pirates and the industry? Anyone who wants that question, it's a hot potato. Uh, yeah, I, uh, Alex. I, I, well, I think the, the interesting part of this is content accessibility as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like when we talk about going to the movie theater, generally Hollywood has released movies everywhere in the world, right? Like <gasps> the ability to get a movie, you know, is, is, is quite difficult or was, was less difficult maybe. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, we have so many complicated contracts with rights owners and stuff like this where the whole reason we need to deal with GOIP stuff is because Netflix Canada has this, but you know Netflix Europe doesn't or whatever. And maybe if we realize we operate in this global world and we kind of have this shared desire culturally when it comes, comes to video content, whether it's sports or cinema, and make the accessibility easier, that cost of that ticket is a lot easier than having to pirate it to watch something not available in your country Absolutely. or something. I mean, a, a great example from the last one was Game of Thrones, which was a, a global simultaneous release, mm -hmm. which they say made it less desirable to pirate. Do, do the industry need to change its thinking? Well, that's supposedly. Well, that, 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 that's the problem, you know. And, and then you will not have enough money. If, if you take sports rights, for example, right. they fund the complete industry. It's right. two thirds of the, of the cost of running sports is coming out of content rights. It's not coming off, out of people going to the stadiums. So, so th there is no way you, go, you will be able to fund that unless you protect it. And, and I think what people need to change their state of mind in cybersecurity, they already did it, but in anti-piracy, the, the service providers and the content rights holders need to start prote protecting their content. S sports is a, we all agree that sports is the the cherry on the very beautiful cake. Mm -hmm. Do the, the companies involved with sports rights need to think differently from the guys working in OTT? Do they, do they, do they about need security to? security and about protection of their assets. So, so what, what we can tell today that they are, they are, first of all, they are trying to enforce, to enforce different types of protection mechanisms on their licenses. So some of the, the uh, my friends over here mentioned the uh, DRM watermarking definitely and they are trying to use more and more techniques in order to to better protect the content they are also trying to help them in order to monitor the different pirate networks and I identify the content over these pirate networks and then if possible take down the content or apply other techniques such as ip blocking and more on the content so definitely it needs to become more of a cyber security war than stay like it's today that it's something that is going to go away. It's not going to go away. It's an imminent threat on these service providers and content owners. Okay. Now, that's okay, I'd like to add to that. It also comes down to you know, the actual psychology of it. You know, social engineering. It's like, why are they pirating? Are they pirating because they can't watch the baseball because they live across, you know, basically across town from the stadium and therefore they're geo-blocked out? And you're like, okay, so I'm hopping on VPN, so I'm coming out of state to watch the game that, you know, that is across town. Or are they, you know, basically, what's their own guilt? Oh, basically, to me, they see that as, well, that's a small crime. It's like, you know, petty theft, right? And then you have the people who are, are password sharing. Oh, well, it's a friend of mine. I just want to watch this one show. But then that's all down. Why are they, why are they doing piracy? And, they, and, then, and, and then it moves up the uh, stack. Are they trying to actually now profit off of your content? Especially when you're talking about, like, a me. Game of Thrones or, like, uh, or, like, or, like, or, like, or, like, high valuable content. You know, is a piracy, you know, you know, or the, uh, the person, you know, stealing the content, then trying to resell it. Because if they're trying to actually make, you know, actual revenue off of it, that's a much higher motivator than 
you know, for them to do piracy as opposed to someone who is just, you know, traveling for business. Yeah. I'm now in Europe, I can't access my content, I have a subscription, but I'm committing piracy by going on VPN to watch my Netflix in the United States. So as part of the psychology of why are they doing piracy, it beats themselves. Are they committing mentally a small crime or a big crime? And then, you know, and then, and then off the content owners, it's better to go after the, the targeted of the people who are truly, truly trying to profit off your own work. Yeah. That's where the target's at first, to have that social balance going down the stack. I, I think we're also seeing a, a shift in how organizations are managing their security. I think when I, I've covered IT security for many, many years, and traditionally it was an in-house activity. And the broadcast sector was generally smart cards and right. you know, DRM, it was in-house. Are you guys seeing more of a shift towards an as-a-service model? I'll ask, I'll ask Joe, do you see more as-a-service adoption of security versus doing it in-house? Uh, <clears throat> I see the potential there. Mm. Um, like for the longest time, we've just simply been a data provider. We're going to give you all the relevant information about your IP traffic, and then we're going to let you make a decision on whether or not that's high risk or low risk. Allow, deny. But the more that we see this evolve and how much sneakier the piracy is becoming and how much more creative they are, I think there is the potential there to be more of a service as a solution um, with this here. Let us actually give you some color commentary on what we've seen uh, uh, um, out there in the wild and how it's behaving, in addition to just having the metadata you know, flow to you. Because it's, it's not a, a common skill set to no. understand geo-blocking, to understand encryption, to understand the and dynamics of, of, a, of a cyber, not just cyber security, but cyber attack. I know it's slightly on the edge, but we are seeing instances now of services being taken down right. maliciously to impact whether it's their share price or their perception with customers. I mean, I'll ask Alex, are you having more cons customers come to you saying, we don't have the skills, can you do it for us? Well, I, th I think, I'll, I'll flip the question a little bit mm -hmm. here. It's more of like, we, we've made the whole idea of distributing video so easy in the traditional non uh, content protected world, so to say, right? Like you can go and record yourself and post it on whatever social media. And from that, we're seeing more and more people want to uh, build streaming services or have a great idea to curate, cur curate content or license stuff. And we, we see people come in that want to have the tools and don't have that. And I think a lot of us here at the show have lowered this barrier of entry to being a telecom operator somewhere or a OTT service provider. And really, we can provide you know security as a service, and we have to be on the ever, at the bleeding edge to basically make sure that our customers, the people that are building these services, are following the best practices, not doing something that'll shoot them in the foot and you know get their content pirated. Well, it's a question for all of you. Now. Whoever can wants to take it I, first, can I take the question? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so what what we see, we see the customers trying to focus on their service and growing the service. And and they don't enough. They do not enough. Have, they do not have enough security expertise mm -hmm. to take on on anti piracy. And they're looking for a trusted partner to to do it for them. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely an approach going there. Uh, they would like to, since there are different size of customers and different level of maturity in terms of security, they definitely would like to consume that as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you are talking more about the tier two, tier three customers that are less experienced in anti-piracy, they will definitely want to see it as a service. Yeah, and they're stretched, right? These, these groups are stretched people-wise, right? Doing a multitude of different things mm -hmm. that today this is the one hot topic and then two weeks later they loop back to the same thing. So mm -hmm. being able to be in the part of the process to help consult and actually help them identify here's what's happening and here's how you can deal with it is, is critical. So I was a journalist for many years and I've never written a story which started off Good job. Today we stopped a hundred pirates. <laughs> it never happens. Maybe in Somalia. We only or we only <laughs> see the bad news of yeah. this got leaked, that got hacked, that got cracked. Are there? Can you guys share any? I know you have to change the names to protect the, the innocent. But are there any good stories 
about how we're actively stopping piracy, reducing piracy, reducing the cost of content, because we don't have to worry about any stories that you guys could share. Can I start? You start with the scale. So, so, so uh, a first example is a customer in Asia Pacific. Of course, Asia I cannot, Pacific. Asia Pacific, right. I cannot mention the name, but uh, we were targeting about 20 pirates for that uh, customer. Um, we were using watermarking, forensic, forensic watermarking, watermarking techniques, both on client as well as on the server side. And, and one of these pirates, out of the, the first 10 uh, pirates that are, have the highest number of subscribers, were, were uh, uh, gradually losing subscribers paying more for content within the pirate ecosystems. Okay. And eventually we saw, we saw messaging going between their customers and the service that they're going to close the service. Right. So that, that was really... So you, you affected the economic model of pirates. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's, that's yeah. a good example. Yeah, same, same thing. We've got uh, customers in Europe where we've had great success, uh, not only with the forensics part, but watermarking, but other methods, which we can't really talk about publicly, that have seen real economic upturn, not only in subscriber revenue, but in customer retention. And it, that's where it's like really working. Okay. And, that, and at that point, you show that to a customer and it, the service sells itself. But this is half the problem. It's, it, I can tell you all the bad things that happened, but it's, no one seems to want to talk about the good stuff. Right. Is, is that your experience, David? Well, well I, mean, I mean, just like life, you always learn more from a bad experience. Mm -hmm. It's always in your mind, basically. Anything that happens and, and negative effect, I mean, changes the actual mind. You actually remember that more. But, but basically, on, on positive notes, I mean, we have clients who, who were forced into online because of COVID. They were, you know, they were traditional schools. Yeah. Now we had a client who had to move everything online because of COVID, doing MCAT, LSAT, and you know, and, and they were, you know, and they were forced into it. So they were like, well, we have to do content security because we still, sorry, because they said they saw all all their competitors' content online being shared, right. but they didn't see theirs. And like, and they were very happy the fact that they thought a little bit of, you know, a little bit of, of effort up front, just a little bit of DRM up front, you know, gave them that advantage where basically their subscribers as well as their revenue was kept because they saw all their competitors, you know, content in YouTube, but not their own. And, and therefore they were able to, you know, I mean, uh, you know, they actually grew, you know, they actually grew, they actually grew very well during the actual lockdown but still offering those services in a, you know, in a method that was accessible to their clients. I can see you thinking, mustn't mention their name, mustn't mention their name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same question. Yeah, yeah so as you stated, um, it's, it's rare when our clients uh, come and give us a pat on the back for doing a really good job, <laughs> but they don't hesitate to let us know when we have an ov oversight in our IP databases. So what we like to do as for Sanity Checks is we like to go on Reddit and uh, look at message boards that say, hey, I'm looking for a VPN that works to uh, circumvent Netflix. And someone will say, hey, uh, try Surfshark. It's been working great for me. Well, little do they know, it's going to stop working from them because we're going to go ahead and step in there and make that no longer a, a possibility. And then you get to see them come back saying, what the, it was working fine a day ago and now it's no longer. Well, you got someone else? Okay, well, try Tunnel Bear. Oh, sorry, we already got Tunnel Bear unlocked. Well, how about hide my ass? Part of my language. Is there uh, actually no, one called hide my hide ass? Hide my ass. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I always like to name drop hide my ass because it's a great VPN name and I always want to be on top of that one. So that's just kind of some uh, real life ground truth that you know we've you know witnessed from the masses, right? Alex. Well, I think I want to take this question in a little different approach and feel free. We we all like have talked about these. Uh, anti-piracy techniques, but the nice thing that has come out of this set is we've created a set of technological tools that can do things like es effectively personal piracy or data protection, and we kind of now have the framework moving forward for, you know, data security for people. We just need to stop building streaming services and do that instead, yeah. but but uh, the, the foundation for, like, securing you know, personal info or medical data or whatever. Like we have to spin this in a positive way because no one should notice DRM or watermarking or whatever if it's doing its job correctly. Um, but you know, maybe we can expand our industry a little bit and uh, well, take so the things we learned that were bad and turn them good. It's like you've read my 
question list. Because I was gonna, that was the last thing I was going to touch on. Now, we've done these events for about yeah. nine years at NAB, and we often talk about content security, strangely enough, because yeah. that's our industry. But if you look, let's look at Europe and look at California. In Europe, if you let personal data out into the world, um, it could be my viewing habits. Do I like adult entertainment? Am I watching certain types of content that's illicit? If you as a provider let that information out and you breach GDPR, the fines to an operator are percentages of your revenue. So if you're a 100 million revenue company and you're paying, what, 3%, that's a serious fine. Are you guys having conversations with your clients that are beyond content into GDPR, into regulatory compliance? Yeah, okay. So maybe I'll take that. So you mentioned before Netflix on credential sharing. So we have a product which is called Credential Sharing and Fraud Insight. And it's all, a, it's all about looking into subscriber behavior and trying to identify the sharers and the fraudsters. However, I can tell you that every service provider we have worked with was really concerned about, pi about privacy and about sharing the information with us. And we put all the measures in place in order to make sure that we follow all the, the, the privacy uh, rules as well as GDPR and okay. other uh, rules out there. So it's, it is a... Are you, are you having those conversations about privacy as well? Yeah, and you know, it's a bigger conversation too with state, local and federal, especially here in the US, yeah. especially following sort of the European example, but it's also about, as it relates to protecting privacy with things we're looking to try to push and do here in the Americas with regards to privacy and, and to content protection that we haven't been able to previously. And I think maybe that's probably one of the big concerns yeah. that local communities have had with this in general. It's again, back to kind of the educational piece, but if it's something that can be pointed to that works other places, I think we'll have an easier time with it here. But it's interesting as well, because a lot of the sessions we've had, I've talked about digital ad, ad insertion and identification of users. I, I get the sense that we're living in again in a world of silos where the content security guys are here, the privacy guys are here, production teams are here, but are we, are we joined up enough as an industry to think about privacy in the round and not just in silos? I mean, David, what's your view? Well, so, uh, I'm not really on the privacy side, but more on the collaboration with actually, uh, you know, from their uh, advertising teams. We, you know, we've been able to show them how, how DRM can say, oh, and basically your most used device is a, 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 a Samsung S20. So let's make sure that your content is geared for that. Uh, basically, show them actually what the subscribers are using for their playback media. Not so much to say, well, John is using this at this point in time, but saying that as a bulk whole, you are basically here are your top devices. Here's how your content's being viewed. Here's how your content's being enjoyed. So basically make sure that you are, you know, when you're doing your packaging, your encoding, your transcoding, that you're targeting the actual, uh, the actual devices and the actual screen size that people actually are using it. So again, I am a rubbish presenter because I forgot to ask the audience, if you have any questions, <laughs> this is a brain trust of experts. Put your hands up and I'll get you. I think I'm okay for time, I am. Are there any questions of our expert panel? I know it's difficult, you feel shy to open yourselves up and ask questions. So what I like to do at this time of the day is bribe people with alcohol. <laughs> Please ask a question, I will find you a nice cold beverage after this session. Right. It'll be a cheap wine. Right it'll be a good wine. Okay, it's a go. Okay, to the spirit. good wine. It'll be a spirit. It'll be a <laughs> low end spirit. Oh, I see. No, go. Anyone? Go on. Sir, you have a look of a man who wants to ask a question. Yay! Get that man a spirit. <laughs> so, having been in this industry for quite a number of years myself, I always like to think about the topic of turning the top of a piracy around to uh, enhancing revenue streams, right? So piracy is a loss of revenue, but I think the potential here is to use a lot of the techniques that you gentlemen represent to help uh, enhance revenue streams. I think David had a, a very good example there where, you know, taking a particular uh, release approach to uh, uh, an e-learning system enabled 
a customer to thrive, to prosper in, in the face of, of COVID. Does anyone else have any examples of using techniques to, uh, to grow revenue streams, use different model business models, for instance, uh, in different release windows around the world uh, that actually enhance the business of their, of their customers? Uh, My microphone is gone. So I'll just paraphrase the question. It's a great question. We've talked a lot about the scary stuff. Pirates, hackers, crackers, bushwhackers. But are there any examples where security technologies are delivering revenue uplift as opposed to stopping revenue decline? It's it, as you're closest to me. Yeah, so, so um, we, we had some very good ideas, especially in relates to advertisement how to try and monetize that advertisement that stays within the pirate networks and, and use that in order to, to increase revenues. Nevertheless, the, the, the feedback that you get from customers is that they don't want to be involved in any way of money that is coming out of pirates. Right. So, so that, that's the challenge over there. So I, I think they need to be more open-minded in that respect and then uh, techniques like that can be used. Okay. I, yeah. I, Go ahead. Yeah, I think like one, one, one piece of technology is, you know, all, uh, part of these techniques we develop are being able to limit somebody's access to something, but that doesn't mean access to watch a single title. It could mean the Ultra HD feed and the HDR version of the content. So there are ways to make those things commercial add-ons to streaming services and kind of give different tiers of subscription to people. And, you know, we, we see this in practice in a lot of places and it's becoming more and more common, but you know these these techniques as uh, are definitely being used for that kind of revenue enhancing add-on, so to say. You can imagine a scenario where uh, an OTT service, let's not just blame Netflix, but like Netflix, suddenly it recognizes through a security technique that a login's being shared, and instead of saying no, you can't come in, it says we notice you're sharing the login. Would you like a subscription? And guess what? You've been recommended by Bob, the person who's login you're stealing. <laughs> Here's 20% off. Is that feasible at this point no, in time? No, this is definitely feasible. Absolutely. That's sure. that's one of the techniques that we are using out of that credential sharing and fraud insight program. Okay. So we are providing the list of sharers to the customers and then they can take up actions. Some of the actions could be for revenue generating or converting into legitimate subscribers. But some of the other actions could also be like password resets or other <laughs> more, uh, uh, you know, uh, active uh, activities. So we are nearly out of time. So I'm going to go down the, the run. I'm going to ask every single person uh, just for one bit of sort of a bit of advice for an organization that might be struggling with content security. So I'm with you, Alex. So I know you get to be first. What one bit of advice would you give to an organization to help them better protect their content and monetize more effectively? I think it's find the right partner and then vendor for this because content security is hard. It's ever changing. And uh, there are plenty of us here that will gladly show you demos of all sorts of cool stuff. And at this point, it's become almost commoditized, or a lot of these techniques have become commoditized to a point that it's affordable as well. So find the right partner, find the right vendor, and I think we're all looking to help you, so. Joe, same question. Um, I actually piggyback off what Alec just said there, and not only finding um, the right vendor, digital element, um, <laughs> but in addition to that, don't hold yourself just to one option. The more information, the more context from multiple approaches can only aid the situation. Furthermore, I would say, pay attention to your history. You can learn a lot from your history uh, and, and then be more, I guess, proactive than reactive in the, in, you know, in the current state of, 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 of what's taking place. David, your one bit of advice. So I'm gonna say that, uh, you know, don't be afraid of it. Basically, uh, a, a content security DRM isn't a black box, you know. Our job is just to educate. And the more information that you understand, the more that we help you educate, the more you say, listen, it's not really as complicated to actually implement some of these initial steps. And then after you start going down that pathway, then you can start going to the more advanced steps. But I mean, don't be afraid of it, uh, as well as, you know, I mean, as well as, the, I mean, there's a little bit of complacency. People are like, well, it's part of the industry, right? Yeah, but you can still 
you know, you know, at the end of the day, you can still mitigate as well preserve your actual assets and your revenue. Cause that's your business. Okay. John. Just to add to what my colleagues have said, you've got to start, right? Yeah. You can't just say, I'm not, I can't do anything about Head it. Head in the sand. Yeah, you, you've, got to, you've got to acknowledge that there's an issue. You get the right team of people involved. You account for it from a budgetary standpoint. It is pennies on the dollar to, for all of us and all of our services compared to the cost of actually acquiring and producing the content. It's part of the cost of doing business. Okay. So work out the numbers. Absolutely, you got to figure it out. No, so it? so I, I think that first of all, they cannot stay blind. They need to start with some kind of an assessment of their situation. Uh, they need to assess the piracy landscape and understand who are the pirates that are targeting them, what, how many subscribers they have, how much they are losing out of that piracy. And second, they need to start to do some vulnerability analysis and, and understand whether their service is vulnerable and how the pirates are exploiting it. Perfect. So, gentlemen, thank you for your time today. Thank it was you. a great session. With a round of applause. Thank you.